Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in yet again. We've had a blast chatting with some amazing folks and uh, again, I just appreciate all your feedback. Just been having a blast with this. Please, if you like the content and you want to see more uh, of these stories basically from these remarkable people, just please, 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 please hit, hit the like button and subscribe to Kicking It With David Akers. I love talking to these people. I, I, I just think that it's amazing to, to hear these, uh, these stories, and, and some of them are just extremely motivated, and, and they're truly go-getters, and, and those are the ones I'm really kind of drawn to. Well, today is, uh, is no different. Today's guest uh, is one of those people, a true go-getter. I'm not sure she ever stops to rest at all. This wife and mother of two seems to, to be getting up in the, in the morning, and the first thing she does is seems to get some sort of exercise in and training to, to make sure she's in tip-top shape. That could be working out in her basement or going on a trail run. Uh, and in the warmer months, she gets out on the lake and does a few sets of water skiing. After she's done with that sort of training, she gets on to her day job where millions of people end up seeing her basically giving you the forecast. That's right. This is Cecily Tynan. She is the chief meteorologist in Philadelphia at Channel 6 ABC. She's hardworking and she balances being a mother and obviously a professional. And along with this career that she has, she is taking care of these kiddos, and my goodness, getting them to their activities, their extracurricular activities, that is, and, and the sports and whatnot. And Cecily's entire family uh, is extremely involved and active as well. Their family, which includes their husband Greg, son Luke, daughter Emma, seem to be hitting the water and the slopes often. They are all accomplished athletes in their own right. But as a professional, Cecily's had so much success. She double majored in journalism and politics and graduated magna cum laude at Washington Lee University in Virginia. She completed meteorology courses and received her seal of approval from American Meteorological Society. Her broadcast awards and honors put her as best on-air talent, and that's in Las Vegas. Um, also in Las Vegas, she was named as the best weather forecaster and then here in Philly, she's been known as the best weather forecaster and best weather vein person. And uh, again, I'm not surprised because everything she does, she gives it her all and she's the best at what she does. So I want to talk a little bit more about her as an athlete. So in the way she dominates her weekend warrior status, if you will now, she is a four-time three-hour sub uh, marathoner, so she can run those marathons in less than three hours. I can't drive a car and be part of that in that amount of time. Uh, she's a world-class professional dual athlete, and think this for a minute. She competed in the Ironman, and this is over in, in uh, Kona, Hawaii. In her age group, she was in the top 10. That's absolutely amazing, mind-blowing. So I'm excited to have Cecily on here, otherwise known as the weather goddess. Hey, Cecily. Uh, welcome to Kicking It With David Akers. As hey, I'm happy to be here. We're just hanging out. Um, I did a little intro 
that, that's, that goes on here, but the goddess of weather, or the weather goddess. Is that right? It was no, the I, weather I, woman I, of God? I, <laughs> what, what, I have to pay you $20 to call me a yeah, weather no, goddess. Oh, absolutely or not. chief meteorologist. <laughs> well, we already know you're the chief meteorologist, and, uh, and you do a great job. And even from my time in Philly, and, and this is going full circle here, so I, I made the announcement that, hey, you're going to be on this week. And, you know, I have the ski community that's out there like, oh, my gosh, this, this person's on there. And then the Philly group is really excited. Uh, so I had all kinds of questions, uh, some football related, kind of weird, but mainly uh, obviously more into your profession. But then it's just kind of interesting. There were, there were some females that were really intrigued by your training and how you keep yourself so fit. So. That'll be all down the line here, but I want to kind of kick this thing off, obviously, with a little bit of who you are, where you're from, because uh, I, I truly believe everybody has a story, and I've, I know a little bit of your story, but I think the more that you can share it, it ends up impacting more uh, if you kind of start from the beginning. Where were you born? Where, what kind of life did you have growing up as a kid and dreams and all that? Well, I was born in Newtown, Connecticut, which was a uh, town that no one had ever heard about until the Sandy Hook shooting. Um, but great place to grow up. But I was actually, I was a congenital hip baby. So I was born without a hip socket, which typically they find out right away as soon as the baby's born. But for me, the doctor somehow overlooked it. And I was about, I think I was about two and a half years old at Candlewood East Beach Club, this little beach club um, in Brookfield, Connecticut. And somebody asked my mom what was the matter with me. And they're like, what? And she's like, well, she's limping. So it turns out I didn't have a hip socket. And so I was put in these big braces. I was put in um, months and months where I had to just lie in a hospital bed with my leg up. I don't remember any of this, but my mom's told me about it. And um, I hated sitting still. And as soon as I was Has out. that changed? Doctor, Has that changed yeah. at all? <laughs> no, I think that's why I can't sit still. Um, and so the doctor told my parents that to strengthen my hips, I should start ballet. So mm -hmm. at three years old, I started ballet and I got really into it. And so in high school, I'm full on. I'm in a ballet company. I want to go professional. My parents are like, whoa, 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 you know, tap the brakes here. That's a tough way to make a living. And my company went to tour in Russia. And my parents wouldn't let me go because it was two weeks of missing high school. And I, I got good grades. And, um, you know, as a teenager, you, you've got teenagers. It was, it was the worst thing ever that could have happened in my life. And, oh, you know, I, I, what am I going to do for two weeks? And so because I couldn't sit still, I joined the track team and the coach put me on hurdles and I loved it. And all of a sudden, like running was such a big part of my life. I quit ballet. I went to a great college, uh, Washington Lee University. Uh, I was on the cross country team there. I guess in high school, I was uh, captain of the track club. And I learned a lot that sports can be a big part of your life, but it can also be a balance. Uh, at WNL, my coach was very much, he was, he was all about academics. And if you had a big test, you could miss practice or shorten it. And, um, and I think that's part of why sports and working out is, is, you know, a part of my life daily. I've just kind of shifted my focus at times with different sports. Absolutely. Um, so let me go back a little bit. I wanted you to kind of get through that, but can you kind of describe like, what does it mean to not have a hip socket? So your hip, the ball has got to go somewhere. Is there no place for there, it? There, 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 it was like this. And so when I would walk, my, my, I would, I would limp my, the, the whole, uh, my leg would go up. And so when they put me in traction and in this big brace, they kind of like, you're almost like a frog style. Um, because when you're younger, the bones are soft. I eventually kind of grew one in, but it should be like this. It's right. more like this now. And so that's what, when I was marathon running, I started to have a lot of problems because I don't have, you know, really that stability. And well, so because of that, I, it's interesting you say that because I went and I had an injury right after college and they did an x-ray and they said that my hip didn't, my, the ball didn't sit up high enough into it. And they actually wondered if that ended up helping my muscles to have more strength 
to almost be more of a rubber band effect to allow my leg to, to kind of go through with a, you know, you can have a loose elastic rubber band and it's not, but you have the ones that are kind of more tight. I mean, it, it, it'll shoot good. Did, do you find that maybe any of that kind of, I'm not going to say it, it's a handicap, but just kind of a deficiency you had in the development there in your hip actually ended up helping you down the line? Um, well, I think I, I shouldn't have chosen marathon running because there's a lot of pounding. <laughs> sure. Um, but then, then I switched over to multi-sport to triathlons and duathlons. And, um, actually I ended up be, getting to be a really good biker, um, cyclist. So maybe, I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I'd ask my doctor, but I don't, I don't think he's alive anymore. The doctor when I was born. You got a buddy just coming in here. Oh, this is Sandy. You want to say hi? This is one of my, one of my two dogs, one of my two rescue dogs. So we, we see your other dog all over social media as well, always running the trails with you. So yeah, my, my little one, Nala. You know, if, if my husband um, was different, I would have like 12 dogs. I would be one of those hoarder ladies. Uh, he stopped. We had three for a while, and now we have two. And he's told me that I'm not allowed to bring another being into the house or he's going to leave. So, R so just two dogs. <laughs> To, to the same lady, so you're not the, the nutty lady. So he is. You, 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 you changed over, but with the triathlon stuff, what, all right, so I understand you're running, but what got you into cycling and to swimming then? Yep. Um, well, it's funny because, um, I mean, I went from, I still remember the day that I ran three miles without stopping and thinking that was huge. And then all of a sudden I went from that to running 10 Ks, uh, to running marathons to running. I ran an ultra marathon of, of 50 K a 31 mile, uh, race. And then I realized that I was trying to make the Olympic trials. And, uh, the, I think the B standard was 248 back then. And I, my fastest time was 254, which is, I think a 638 pace. And so I had to get, I had to drop a few more minutes. And then I started running too many marathons. So I got injured, but I still, I liked competing. I liked working out. And so, um, I thought, you know, I'll try multi-sport because then you're still running, but you're, you're, you're swimming, you're biking. And so I started, I went to a master's, um, swimming at Villanova on Sunday. And so I arrived thinking, um, you know, I'm going to be good because I'm a good athlete. And I tell you, I had to get on the lane with the 80 year old women and they were killing me. <laughs> and so um, Rick Simpson, who is a Villanova swim coach, um, he took pity on me and he said, listen, I'll coach you. You know, you're never going to, you're never going to be an amazing swimmer, but you'll be good enough. Yeah. And then, um, and then I just started biking with um, different biking groups who were better than me. Actually, that's how I met my husband. Uh, he would help push me up the hills so I could stay <laughs> smart guy. <laughs> exactly. And, um, and I learned, that if I wanted to get better at anything, you know, whether it's sports, whether it's um, professionally, that get with people who are better than you. Get with people who know more than you do. Get a coach. I had Jeff Devlin coaching me, and he was fantastic. And um, when I was marathon running, I would drive up to Emmaus, to, to Runner's World headquarters, and I would run with Bart Yazzo. And so I feel like I learned so much more, even, you know, my, my college cross country coach, I stayed in touch with him after I left college for running advice. So I found, I mean, you know, with water skiing, I'm always sending you videos and stuff. People who are better than you are at something like you can learn so much from them. So kind of thinking about, I guess, this kind of sports dynamic, um, was, was there anybody when you were younger that kind of the mindset of, of, what, what kind of got you into to it to say, hey, I want to be at, at this level. You're not just like a weekend warrior. I mean, I say that, I mean, we are that kind of now, but like you, you went to Kona and that's just not a normal thing for people to go and compete in Ironman or in your case, Iron Woman, basically, you know, but so what was the drive? What was your motivation? Who who were your mentors and, and people you kind of looked up to to, to say, man, I, I, I'm not going to have this, this quit attitude. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push through. Because honestly, you're talking about running a 50K. I've never run 50K in all my lives combined. So everything I did was, was 
uh, fast switch only. It was really short sprints, explos explosiveness, and then and you stop. And so now I'm just kind of getting to a place where I can do an elliptical for 30 or 40 minutes. I can't take the pounding on my knees, but uh, so if you can kind of go back and, and kind of give us that kind of mindset of what, what kind of drew you to there. You know, um, in high school, I had a track coach um, who was oh my God, Gary Benas, I think is his name. He was a marathon runner and he came in, I think, second at the Boston Marathon and he was an unknown. And um, and I think he talked a lot about marathon running and that that kind of inspired me. But honestly, I think it's something that evolved. Part of it was my social life. When I came to Philadelphia more than 25 years ago, I didn't know anybody. And there was a women's running group called Fast Tracks that that had workouts in a middle school. It's, I think it's Wayne Middle School, close to where I lived in Chesterbrook. And I just wanted to meet some people and have some running partners. So I start, I joined that. And um, Lorraine Jasper, who is an amazing master's track runner now, one of my best friends, she was just the girl in front with the long, dark hair I was trying to catch the whole time. You know, not even beat her. I just wanted to get behind her. And, um, and I think for me, it was more that if I was going to do something, I wanted to be the best at it for me. Not, not necessarily better than anyone else, but so why do that, something if you're hold, not going to try to be the, as good as you can be? So hold that thought. Trying to, so to some people, that's, that's a novel idea. Like, I don't want to be the best. I just want to get through the week. See, I, I love that mentality. And, and that's one of the things that, that I, I, I've seen in you in, as we start talking and trying to compete against ourselves on the water. But you, you've had such an incredible pass on as an athlete. And not even that. We haven't even gotten into your professional career. But what... Was there somebody that instilled that in you, or do you feel like that's just always been there? That's a drive that's inside. That's that that passion. And, and when they talk about passion, you've got to be willing to suffer and sacrifice for something to give you that kind of that burning, that that ember that can then be built into the flame. So, where do you think that part comes from? Honestly, I have no idea. Um, I guess my parents, but uh, for me. Um, <laughs> at least professionally, part of, um, part of my drive came from wanting to prove my dad wrong. Because when I told him I wanted to get into broadcasting, he said, well, very few people are successful in that. And I said, okay, I'm going to be one of those people. And whenever I got promoted or, or moved to a bigger market, I would call him up, hey, dad, guess what? You, you were wrong. <laughs> you know, I just got a promotion. So I don't know. I can't say there was really one person. I mean, definitely, I think it had a lot to do with my upbringing. My dad um, worked for Sikorsky Aircraft. He was uh, raised in Yonkers, came over from Ireland. His, I think his mother or his grandmother um, was, was a, um, a single mom. And he, he went to the Merchant Marine Academy to get a good education. And he was a self-made man. And we had a pretty nice lifestyle in Newtown. And it, it, was, it wasn't because anyone gave it to my dad. It's because he worked hard for it. And so I think that I just... Thought if you again, if you're going to do anything, do it really well, work really hard, or it's kind of a waste of time. I mean, why bother if you're not going to at least try to be as good as you can possibly be? Well, first off, as girl power, as a as a dad that has a daughter, I want her to have that same aspect of of, of an internal drive. But Seth, that's not a male or female thing. That's a that's us as a human race. We should strive to be better, and you're you're doing an amazing job as far as that goes. Um, you pushes me. It, it it ticks me off at times because you've improved. We're, we'll get into the water skiing later, but it ticks me off because of how good you've become in such a short amount of time. But I digress. So do you think that your kids are drawn to that because I, I know that they're really into snow skiing. We'd love to see them more on the water skiing side a little bit. Uh, but it seems like in, in the summertime, you're either behind your Malibu surfing and Greg and, and, and Luke and, and, and Emma are just doing all kinds of tricks out there, which is kind of funny because it's very similar to what I do with my own family behind our Malibu as well. And then you get to the ski lake and 
you're with your Nautique 200 with some friends out there, and I feel like I'm kind of doing the same thing. But it becomes a, a family affair uh, for you in the winter time because that's really something that you all really seem to be doing. You 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 go up to the Poconos just about every weekend, right? And and your kids are pretty accomplished on, on the slopes. And actually, you know, you sent me a pretty gruesome break of Emma uh, with her leg. And I mean, again, takes after mom because she sucked it right up with a nasty break. If you can go into that a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, my kids, uh, I have to say, they love snow skiing. They're on the um, Jack Frost race team. They started, I guess my daughter started skiing when she was about three and my son about four. And um, my So they were old. They're, yeah, <laughs> actually, like when my son joined the race team, uh, he was already a little little bit behind. Like there were some kids who were on it a few years before. Um, and my they both really took to it. I mean, it was probably about one, we had these par these um, parent-kid races at the end of the season. I think I beat Luke one year and then he was faster than I am um they're they they love it that's like that their snow skiing is like my water skiing like it's their true passion my daughter she was really hoping for a great season this year um she trained really hard in the off season she we were up in jack frost it was kind of a warm day when you have that heavy wet snow and she was skiing on one ski and she's great at that but then they had a course set up stubbies like a slalom course and she asked the coach if she could put on both skis to do the course. And he said, ah, try to do it on one ski. And, um, and I actually saw the fall from the lifts and she just kind of toppled over, slid out, but she broke her tibia. She fractured in three places. Yeah. It was pretty, pretty gnarly. Oh, yeah, um, a lot of pain, um, ski patrol got her down the mountain. I took her to Geisinger ER. They had to give her morphine to take the boot off. Then we went to chop. And the next day she's put back together. She, um, she's on crutches. She's been going to the mountain to watch her friends ski. She's in the basement working out, doing what she can. And she's got a great attitude about it. And she's like, next year, I'm going to rock. I'm going to be even better. And my son for skiing, it just comes easy to him. Like he's just, he's just, he likes to go fast. And, um, I, it's funny how you're talking about Is his name Ricky Bobby on coming. the slopes. What'd you say? His name Ricky Bobby on the slopes. He wants to go fast from Tal Talladega Nights. I want to go fast, Mama. <laughs> he um actually they used to call him uh, Eddie the Eagle because on on the um terrain park he likes to go high too. But um talking about the kids um as far as you know instilling that I want to be really good. Um, Emma definitely has that. My son, I think he's been up to the point. Just it's been easy for him. And he's been fifth in the state. And I'm kind of like, well, you know, if you want to be first, you have to start running with me, you know, or hit the, hitting the weights a little bit more. But I think it's something you just have to find out on your own. You know, you're, you know how it is. Your parents can't tell you what to do. It, it, it's funny. Um, I'm a few years ahead just with my kids, um, especially my oldest, Luke, who's now at UCLA. And I believe I was coaching him on kicking and punting. And, and I can say the same thing to him. And then Brett Kern, who's the Titans punter, says the exact same thing, and it is absorbed a little bit more. But it seemed interesting to me because once he went out there, all of a sudden I got a little bit smarter. And not that he was discrediting me out there before, but I think it was more of a realization that everything that we've been trying to instill in them gets understood at a certain level. You become a little bit smarter. Uh, the one thing, I, I used to coach flag football over in the Marlton and, and Medford area in Jersey. And one of the things I would say to the kids, like, look, when we're running sprints at the end, it, you, you might come in first, you might come in last. If you come in last and you've given it everything you have, then good for you. If you've come in second and you could have come in first, then shame on you. And I think that's kind of the, the gist for life that I try to tell my kids. And the same thing kind of to Luke, you're fifth in the state. Are you okay with that? Are you giving it your best to be first? Because if you truly want to be first, what are you willing to sacrifice for that passion to be be that way? And then, uh, and it's interesting too because the kids that have that extra just gift, if you will, to do it, sometimes it's interesting to see if that other aspect of them. Well, I want to work harder to get even better, if and when that kicks in. And I bet you it will. I hope so. He's not listening to me, but you know, he's 15 years old. He's not going to listen to his mom. Luke, listen to me. 
There are going to be people that have just as much talent. It's the person that puts in that extra little bit of effort that will make you even better, buddy. Promise you. Uh, no, you've got amazing kids, and they're doing amazing stuff out there. Uh, but let, let's let's kind of go into back to college. You, you're into journalism and politics, right? Politics. I know. We've never had those discussions. Ever. Oh yeah. So um, anyway, so. I, why why meteorology was it back to your kid you're, you're you're staring up at the stars you're looking at the clouds you know what what, what is it you know actually I, I would be lying if that were the case um for me i wanted to get into broadcasting when i watched the news coverage of challengers the space shuttle exploding yeah. i remember being in high school totally dating myself so 35 years today oh it, it probably is i think it is oh my gosh yeah i think you're right so I, I remember hearing about it in, in the cafeteria um, at my high school, going home and watching Dan Rather, I guess I was watching CBS back then, sorry, ABC, and I'm um, thinking, wow, I like just hanging on every word he said and thinking what a public service he's doing. He's, he's giving all this information to people you know, around the world and around the nation anyhow. And, um, and up until then, I wanted to be a lawyer. And at that point, I, you know, I told my parents I wanted to go into broadcasting. And that's when my dad said, oh, you know, no, nobody makes it. So I went to Washington Lee University. They had a great department of journalism uh, that was founded by Robert E. Lee and TV station. And um, I actually, I just, politics I thought was fascinating. And I thought if I'm going to be re a reporter or an anchor, I want to know what I'm reporting on. And um, my just, I did a bunch of internships. My parents lived in England for a few years. So I did an internship at CNN in London, which was unbelievable. Yeah, unpaid internships. Um, then I did an internship in Roanoke, Virginia, the CBS affiliate WDBJ. And then when I was a senior, they hired me as a weekend reporter. Um, I, was, I think it was April, my senior year. So I would take classes during the week and then I would report on the weekends. And then I had friends at a fraternity house who had parties on Wednesday nights for me. So that was, you know, can't miss the parties. Um, and so, and then I had a part-time job when, when I graduated. So I was, you know, I was, I wasn't making much money. I was working, I guess, three days at the TV station. I was a waitress, which was actually fantastic because I got to know all the city councilmen by waiting on them. I would get their phone numbers. And so on weekends, if I hey needed now. an interview, <laughs> <laughs> Purely professional, but if I needed an interview about something, I'd call them up. I'd meet them at their kids' soccer games, and I could, you know, interview them. And um, and then I was an aerobics instructor, which meant I had a free gym membership, and I worked at a casual corner, which I'm sure you've never heard about, but it was a women's clothing store, so I had discounted clothes. So I, you know, for like my eighteen thousand dollars a year, I was living really well. And then um, I did that for a year. And then an opening came for Weekend Weathercaster. And I called in sick to all my jobs. I practiced for five days straight because that green screen can be a scary place. And I nailed it. And then I thought, well, I, don't, I know nothing about weather. So then I started taking classes in meteorology. So I kind of went about it backwards. But I feel like I got a great liberal arts education. And I felt like I became a good communicator. And that's part of being a good meteorologist. You know, even if you know everything, if you have it in your head and you know the forecast really well, if you can't communicate it, if you can't kind of, you know, grab the viewers and um, make it feel personal, then they're not going to listen to you anyhow. So, you know, I, I wouldn't have done it any other way. Wow. That's all I can really say about that. I mean, it's... It's not really what I was thinking your answer was going to be. It's like, oh, yeah, as a kid, you know, I'd sit there and twirl flowers and whatever. And, and it's kind of like you're very – in the NFL on, on the kickoff coverage call, we call them the tip of the spear because you're the first down. You, you're almost kind of that in, in your – whatever you're doing, you, you're sharpening the spear so that you can attack any of these obstacles in life that, that kind of you have in front of you. It's, it's inspiring, Seth. I mean – Look, I, I, there's a reason why I, I like having certain people on here. Um, but you and I know on the skiing side, we, we had Regina on not too long ago. Regina Who's Jake amazing. Was, absolutely, right? We both want to ski. But there, there's a common thread in whether you're talking female athletes, you're talking men, whatever. At the highest level of whatever you do, there's so much practice and effort that puts 
into whatever you're trying to do to be great, that it comes across as being like it's easy. Well, anybody can get up there and do that. Well, speaking in front of people, it's an easy opportunity for me to, to just say whatever. But it, there, it has to be so much more calculated. And it seems like you're very calculated in the way that you attack your professionalism um, for, for what you do, but also in your athleticism. And so your mornings start off, and I see a lot of it on, on Instagram. Obviously, you work, uh, would you call it just the afternoon? You know, the five, Afternoon and nights. I do, I do the 5, 6, and 11 o'clock. Right. So you're late night. Before you, you know, you got to get up in the morning, and um, obviously, you know, kids are off to school. This year's a little different in, in in that regard, but you get after it in your training. And I see, you know, these montages you do. Can you kind of give us because some of the questions that people ask, like, what what's your training? How has it changed over the years? Like, one of the times I did a picture of me playing with the Eagles, and I was about two hundred and nine pounds, and I was lifting in a way that was low reps, a lot of weight, and big rest between. And so I just was kind of bulky and thick, and I was power and, and stop. And then I changed to be more of an explosive plyo guy, lighter weight, but a lot of reps. And then my weight shifted about 185 pounds. I went to three Pro Bowls in one way and three Pro Bowls in another, but I had success at both. I felt a lot better lighter, though. And so, obviously, when you train as a marathon runner or you're training as a, a snow skier, and now you're doing stuff as the water skier, what, what kind of um, training do you feel like works best for you and, and uh, you get the most out of it? Because, I mean, obviously, you're, you're, you know, you're jacked, you know, so. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, um, it's, it's, I feel like my body has totally changed in kind of the opposite way of yours. When I, when I was marathon running, you know, it's all strength to weight ratio and, and you got to be lean. And this stuff up here is not going to help you. You know, I mean, like if you have, you have big muscles, actually, I, I remember telling Adam Joseph, um, who's a meteorologist at Six ABC, when he wanted to try to qualify for the Boston Marathon, he was running marathons. I said, dude, you got to stop the heavy lifting. You know, he has nice big muscles. I'm like, that's, that's dead weight when you're running. Mm. So I, I should, I have a picture when I'll show you later when I, when I won a half marathon and like there was no body fat in me, very lean muscle for water skiing. Um, I joined flow point, which I love. So, um, Marcus Brown does the coaching, his wife, Jenny Labaw, who's, you know, a CrossFit extraordinaire and world champion. She does these workouts and I'm lifting, you know, I'm doing, um, squats. I'm doing deadlifts. Um, I'm trying to lift heavier weights. I'm trying to put on muscle and it's more explosive power, um, box jumps, you know, and, and a lot of the training is for, for water skiing, for when something goes wrong, that you can all of a sudden, you know, brace and you're not going to hurt yourself. They say part of the philosophy is so you could just, you can ski the rest of your life, which I'm hoping to do. I'm thinking the rate I'm going when I'm 90, I'm going to be really, really good. <laughs> but, um, I think that this program is amazing. And again, I went to find coaches who knew what they were talking about. I don't know how to, how to train on my off season for water skiing, you know, water skiing. I've been doing it for like two years on the course. So, um, I love it. And now I love to go into the basement and work out. My son got a, well, my son got a squat rack for Christmas. So I just, I got to make sure it works, you know, three days a week or so. <laughs> but I think that. it's fun. Yeah. So kind of going back to, I, I guess I would say the, the idea of trying to protect yourself on the water is, is, is a key. Um, and I, I'm assuming that when, when Marcus is talking about this, he, he has seen some of your falls maybe, because I know they've seen some of my falls out there, and we need it, right? But that's, that's one thing that, again, going back to Regina Jacobs we had not too long ago, she trains incredibly as well, and she was kind of talking about the same thing because she jumps as well. That she has to be able to take those hits, uh, and that I don't think when I started preparing for water skiing or just being lighter or whatever, and still trying to find that strength or weight ratio. And and look, 
I have a few more cookies in me than, than, than you have in you. My daughter during this COVID has, I called her the devil because she just cooks all these baked goods and I just, it, it would be a sin if I didn't try them and, you know. It would be insulting you know, her feelings, have to eat it, right? Yeah. Got to. <laughs> you know, so definitely trying to keep that lean down. But I never really thought of it because of an in, in, injury situation. I kind of thought of it more of, well, this is going to help me have the strength to be able to do what I want to do. But it takes me kind of back one step. You said you've only been skiing two years, of course, but when did you start skiing in general? Like, why did you start doing that? You know, it was when we bought a house up in the Poconos. That was probably about 10 years ago. Um, got a used 18-foot chaparral and kind of taught ourselves how to ski. Um, I was so proud when I could get up on one ski. Uh, and then, of course, I, I taught myself. So it's leaning leaning back on the tail of your ski as much as you can, which is a habit I'm still trying nice to Nice spray, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, dip and everything. Um, and so, and then, you know, then we progressively got nicer boats. And then for my 50th birthday, that's when my husband bought me um, the Ski Nautique 200 use, which I love. Best, best birthday gift ever. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's just kind of evolved. And, um, and then I was here and I think I posted something um, on water ski on my Facebook page and someone from a local water ski club, Fort Indian Ski Club, contacted me. So then I started skiing on the Schuylkill River, no course, but just free skiing. And then, um, and then I went to Florida to visit some relatives in Fort Lauderdale. And this was, um, this was probably about five years ago and went to McGinnis Ski School and they had a course. And once I was on the course, I was hooked. And now I'm, I'm a member of um, South Jersey Ski Water Ski Club, which you've been there. Tiny little, tiny little pond, you know, in, you in the middle of the woods. <laughs> Very small, um, just big enough for an overlapping course. Uh, and and like I love it. It's my addiction, and I I I go there usually three days a week during the week, and then I free ski on weekends with my family. And um and yeah, I just but it's funny. I wish that. Back when I taught myself how to slalom ski, I wish I, I talked to somebody who knew what they were doing, and they would have said, "Oh, you're doing it all wrong." So you know how it is. You have to you have to get out of those bad habits, and a lot of it is core. You know, you never. I think a lot of people think it's it's your arms. You know, it's it's the core to try to keep you in that athletic stance and try to get the hips up. You know, which is, again something I'm still desperately working on. But um, I I love it because I feel like. Number one, it's fun. Number two, I love the water ski community. I mean, what a community where people just want you to do well. And um, and like number three, I think it's the best all over body workout you can get. Like I can't find anything that even Absolutely. comes close. So, so, you know, speaking of workouts, I wear this thing. It's a whoop strap, right? And it's similar to what people talk about with Fitbit and Apple Watch, whatever. And I use it more for my recovery and it kind of really tracks my sleeping and uh, respiratory rates and all that. So I, I think it's a really cool, I guess, tool, if you will. But Matt Reaney, who, who's down in Florida as well, he, I've seen him post some things. So I've reached out to him. I said, Matt, the one thing I don't understand is this, the amount of strain on your body to run six buoys is a ton. And I don't care really what line length you are because it's kind of, built more for your ability each line length you're you're on but my numbers are always low but I'll go coach a high school football game and my numbers are through the roof with this strain and I don't understand it I think there's something off on the algorithm because what you've said is true it is truly in my opinion one of the greatest total body workouts you can have so I, I just went last week and, and and I skied seven sets in about 48 hours and I told some of my buddies I said kid could you find that two by four? They're like, what are you talking about? It's like the two by four that somebody used to go and smack me across the back of my shoulders because I couldn't lift my arms the next day, you know? It's oh, such, yeah. I feel the same way you do. I feel like the ski community has been extremely welcoming. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a site that I go to regularly called Ball of Spray. And they were talking about celebrities that, that are out skiing. And, and there's really not a lot. And I mean, this used to be on TV when I was a kid. I would watch these incredible guys like, um, you know, Andy Mapple and, you know, even like Chris Parrish, uh, 
the guys like Marcus Brown and, and, and those guys. But then on the, on the women's side, the, the Dina Mapples, the Christina Overtons, and, and they just were amazing. And you would see it like, the, I think they're hot summer nights or hot sizzling nights or whatever. And they would go on this tour. But now what we see on TV are, are things like spike ball, which, I mean, it's a fun game, but, you know, cornhole. But there's not the the athleticism that it takes to be able to run what some of these people run. And, and for people that, that may be watching this and don't understand skiing, you, you're going to go through what are two kind of orange buoys. Those are the gates. And you have six buoys to go around and then you go through two more at the end as your exit buoys. So the idea is to go through all six buoys at a line length, shorten that line to another length, keep making it until you can't make them all. And depending on where you are in your ability, you kind of work up in, in speed. Cecily, you started off, your first pass you ever made was at 26 miles an hour, a full pass in a course, and now you're skiing up to 34 miles an hour, which is the top speed for women's pro uh, open water. And it happens to be the same speed I ski, but men's open water is at 36. And once you turn 35, you don't have to ski that anymore as a man. So I don't feel like going there. I think when I turn 55, 55 or 56, I think my speed goes down to 32 and I can't wait. <laughs> it's going to be so much easier for me. But people don't understand to go from... 26 to 28 to 30 to 32 to 34 and then you've also shortened the line from 15 off to, to 22 off you know seven feet shorter there is, is is considerable so what do you feel like has been your on the water has been your most challenging thing to to overcome to to get better do you think you know, honestly, I think it's, um, it, I'm a squatty skier. I think it's my, my butt's back <laughs> <Right here. laughs> and I'm working on that. And, um, last time I, I went down to Florida, I, I found that, um, and I was sending videos to Marcus, um, on my, on my, um, onside turns, wait, let me think, um, no, com coming off my, coming off one, no, 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 coming off my onside turns, uh, two, four and six. I, I could get in really no 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 wait uh, it's the other way coming off my offside turns one, coming off five. one three and five I could get in really good position for some reason coming off my onside turns my butt slips back and um so I've been in the basement I've got my my ski handle tied to a bungee tied um to a pillar in the basement and I'm I'm practicing every day so Marcus said like two minutes a day, just get in that position. And honestly, like I wasn't doing it right in the beginning. And, um, and so I, I'm hoping that if I can get in that position in my basement, that it's going to translate to the water. A lot of it's muscle memory and a, a lot of it is strength. It does take a lot of core strength to get in that athletic stance where, you know, your hips are forward and your shoulders are back and the handles down. I mean, typically when you learn how to water ski, you're kind of like that. So it's the opposite. So, I mean, I'm, I'm working on that. And also, I think it's a lot of the strength. I mean, when I got injured two years ago on the course, um, uh, I, I, what is my uh, gluteus medius, I ripped. Uh, it was because I was just trying, I was chasing buoys. I wanted to, you know, hit a PR and I didn't have good form. So I think now mentally, I don't want to worry about advancing. I just want to get really good form. And then I feel like, I feel like the buoys will come. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm seeking help in that and trying to, you know, get good coaching and not good. Hopefully it works. We'll see. Well, but, you know, I'm going to have fun no matter what. There's, there's definitely a tendency in whatever you have achieved. You've, you've always gone after the better people in your field to, to, to find that help. I mean, we just happen to connect because of the Philly connection and, you know, I would see what you were doing on, on social media and, and be like, oh my gosh, you're, you're killing it. But I feel the same way in, in some of the things, like I was talking to Chet Raley and the guys like Paul Turner and um, even, even I've talked to Regina about this as well, but th there are a lot of moments where I have to feel it for me. I can see it. I can see other people do it. I see that I'm not doing what I need to do. And Chet talks about obviously having a, a behavior change. You're not 
getting upset about what you're doing wrong, but the things you're doing right, and what can we do to change the behavior to make those things that aren't going right more right, if that makes sense. And I know I have a tendency to, to if you will, have your butt down, but I believe that's the answer to my equation. I have to actually figure what the equation out and, and back it up. And so I have a tendency to go back to my tail and rock back but it's all starting from being kind of too far over on my 135. And so when I'm talking to these people that really know skiing, and I, I've talked to a lot of them, nobody can tell me in a way that I can say, ah, that's it. When I come out and I see the handle on my hip, and you know, the V between the handle and the boat and the ski and going across, and I'm in this aligned or stacked position, whatever, and it creates energy and speed off to the next buoy, I can't visualize that for some reason. And I've always been a very athletic, kind of probably like your son, things come somewhat easy. Um, but I am struggling, struggling to do this. Regina said again, if you, I keep going, have to going back to her, but she's like, yeah, she surpassed her dad when she was seven years old, when she went 35 crazy. off. I'm oh like, my gosh. okay, well, I'm just going to pick up chess. You know, then I watch, you know, Queen's Gambit. And I said, well, I can't even play chess anymore for crying out loud, you know? Well, so you know, there's like, always going to be someone better than you, you know, especially when you find, you pick up a sport like this, like you and I, you know, later in life. And so, but I feel like that's kind of, that's the fun of it. Because when part of the reason why I quit running races is that, I got to the point, you know, you basically have 10 years of improving when it comes to running. And I got to the point where I was running the same races every year and I was getting a little slower every year. I mean, I was still doing well compared to other people, um, but I was getting slower and it took the fun out of it. What I think about for water skiing, for someone like you and someone like me, when we're, we didn't start when we were sick, the, be the best days are still ahead of us. And so that's what I think that's part of what keeps me wanting to come back to it and keep, you know, wants me to do these ridiculously hard workouts in my basement for, you know, an hour, three days a week is that, you know, that you can get better at this. And at, at my age, right, you're, you're a little younger than I am, but to have a sport where I can be improving is really exciting. And again, I mean, it's fun. Even, even if you have a bad day on the water, it's, it's better than a good day. Fun. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I completely, I completely agree with you on that. And, and you know, you you talked about the community, and I did a little bit as well. But I, I feel like it's a little bit like a locker room feel to me. You know, they 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 do want to get you better. It's interesting on this. So last week, uh, I got to drive. I was driving a guy named Paul Turner, and I got to drive the Sure Path. And I don't know if you've heard much about this, but they're going I've heard to do that. Yeah. Um, so understand that. To be off, you're off, you have to be off 20 centimeters, which is eight inches. You know, you're going down the course, the skier is pulling. If you're off one segment of, of 20 centimeters, or I think a combined total after gate to exit, somewhere around like 48 maybe, then it's an automatic re-ride. Wow. I feel like I'm a halfway decent driver. I don't feel like I'm a tournament style driver, but for for people 35 and off, I've driven people into 39 off. I was blown away how bad I was. And I'd go back and watch it and I'm like, "Oh my goodness, this is this is terrible. How many really good drivers are going to see this and be like, "You're terrible." But what it helps you to understand is the dance between the skier and, and the boat and the boat driver. And the, the reality of, of some of the things that I was realizing is that I'm taking away the line from the skier at the buoy and then giving him line back when he needs me to take it. So oh, I'm like yeah. double whamming him, you know. And it, well, you'll get I mean, better at it though. But you know, but I mean, there's something else you can get better. Absolutely. That's, that's my point. And, and there are things that, we want to do, so I want to see you, if I'm driving you, I want to see you get a, a, a new PB. Most drivers that are out there want to do well enough so that you can have success. And then a little bit to it, because I had a buddy, he got a, a, 
his first pass at 38 off at the end of the season this year, and I drove him. And I feel as much of, a, of an accomplishment driving a guy to a, a PB than, than as much as he, you know, he got it. So, again, that's a, some of the things I love about, about the sport. But the technology, whether we're talking about skiing, with, with the bindings, the, the fin setups, that's over your head and my head. Oh, and yeah. we have to lean on our team. Like, I know we've both been through, like, what are we doing here? We're in cold water. we got to move the bindings. we got to adjust. we got to add some depth in the fin. But just kind of all those things around it to the point where the guys I ski with down at Area 41, we're thinking about getting the sure path. And it will be interesting if you guys think yeah, about Yeah, we should get it. one. Well, I have to say, like, the first time I drove on the course, I was terrified, especially in the little lake that, that I'm on. You know, you get to the end, you got to do a quick turnaround. But um, I again, I think I think it's it's a fun challenge, and I think I feel like if if you if you're skiing on the course, you have to be able to drive too. And even um, with Greg Hirsch, who is kind of my coach and driver here, I mean, he's been skiing for like 60 years, but he's been injured, and so he stopped slalom skiing for the better part of a decade. He's now on two skis. I'm skiing him down the course, and hopefully this year we'll get him back on one. So I feel like that's almost another aspect of it. And you do. You like to see people do well. Get him doing the exercises that you're doing. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Good Get point. him on flow yeah. point with Marcus yeah, and Jen. Yeah, I should. I should. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and Greg's obviously, I mean, I've been able to ski with Greg. Greg, Greg knows what he's doing out there in the course. I've skied, you know, seen what he can do. But his son, Mike, is a very accomplished skier too. And, again, it goes back to, to really what this um, – this community is about. So I want to do one thing about you. You're, you're talking about some of these people, and <laughs> we're gonna have fun with this. So you're talking about some of the people that that have done and and taught you things. And one of them was Jim Gardner, right? He is revered in Philly. He's the best. He's the best. <laughs> so let me ask you for, first off, and, and is there any truth to the fact that Ron Burgundy? From Anchorman was somewhat after after Jim. Jim says no. Jim says I think it was like Mort Crin or John Facenda or something. But like he looks just like Jim. You know, Ron Burgundy looks just like Jim. So I mean, I I don't. Jim says no, it wasn't. But I I think it was. Yeah. You know, the thing about Jim is when when I first started working with him, I have to say like he scared the bejesus out of me. Like he was really intimidating because, you know, he was just such an icon. And, um, and then you realize he's got a great sense of humor and he's just, he's kind of self-effacing. Uh, we had one time where he said something in the toss to me that wasn't really correct. And I kind of glossed over it. And during the commercial break, I said, well, Jim, I didn't want to correct you on the air, but you know, and then told him what he said wrong. He said, are you kidding me? He said, correct me, absolutely correct me. He's like, if I ever say anything wrong, correct me because this is what I'm telling viewers and I don't want to tell them anything that isn't correct. And then we've had, you know, funny moments too when, I mean, like stupid stuff when my earring falls off and um, Jim gets up off the set, takes his microphone off. The producers are freaking out. They're like, you know, it's like, oh, Traveler's on the move here. And he goes behind me, finds me my earring, gives it to me live on the air. That goes viral. Like the next day, like Reaches and Kelly, they have it on. And it's just like these these moments and none of that's scripted. And and I feel like like working next to him, like when I first got to um at six ABC Action News, like more than 25 years ago, I remember I was really, really intimidated because everyone seemed so polished and so smooth. And first time I I was on the air, my my kneecaps were shaking so much I thought viewers would be able to see it, <laughs> like through my suit. And my news director said, just watch, observe, and they'll pull you up to their level. And that's how I feel like with Jim is that he's just, he's not playing a role. He's himself and he's totally honest. And I feel like that's helped me. That's what I try to be on the air, you know, and, and every now and then you'll, you'll make a mistake or, but, and you have to be willing to kind of laugh at yourself sometimes too. I mean, oh, we gotta anything, be able to laugh at ourselves. you know, yeah, that, that's it in life in general. And, but does he, because I know, you, again, you're a marathon runner and you're big time. When you say you're going on to a jog, do you use a silent J? 
<laughs> Wait, what do you mean? Is this a movie? Ron, Burg Ron Burgundy would talk about jogging. <laughs> so I used to go be before the game, you would give some sort of a, a forecast in Lincoln Financial Stadium, like what's going to happen. So in Philly, who's your team? Are, do you follow the Eagles, the Flyers, the Sixers, you know, the Phillies? Do you, are you into any of those sports or is it more? I, I, the Eagles. Yeah, I, I have to admit, like, I'm not, like, I watch a little bit of the Flyers. Um, I, I'm not into basketball, really. Um, I have to say, like, the Eagles don't quiz me about players or anything. But when we won the Super Bowl, that was, like, the best day ever for our family. We were up at Camelback. It was sleeting and raining. It was disgusting. My my son had a slalom race. He won. Like his first his first run with slalom uh, racing, you have two runs typically. His first one, he won by like a minute, which or not uh, no 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 what am I saying? It was like two seconds. And it, it's you know like a 50 second minute, race. Two seconds, two seconds. Yeah, big difference there. Um <laughs> And so I remember I said to him, I said, Luke, like your second run, all you have to do is just go easy. Just don't crash. You're going to win. And um, his coach went up to him and said, you probably have a lot of people in your head right now. Put it all aside. Do what you think you need to do. And my son glared at me. He goes out. Second run. He wins by three seconds. He crushed it. So, and then we had to wait a long time for the award ceremony, but first sanctioned race that he ever won gold. So then we drive all the way back, you know, in the sleet and freezing rain, get to a friend's house and they had the Super Bowl party, get there by halftime. And then, you know, the Philly, Philly uh, play, you know, we, even before we won, I remember saying, this is like the best Super Bowl game ever. And then we won. And, and my son said, this, this is the best day of my life. And like, as a family, you know, it, it was just, I just, I like to keep replaying that in my head. Like my son wins this first ski race and the Eagles win the Super Bowl with a backup quarterback. Like <laughs> who thought that could happen? We need, we need Luke to, to win more races and the Eagles to win more Super Bowls. So let's just kind of get that cranking. Let's have that starting off for 2021. Okay. Let's get that fresh start going. Uh, real quick, I had a couple questions from some viewers, if you wouldn't mind here. Um, how do you feel about the criticism that you get when you are off on a snowfall count? Um, I'm not happy about it, but, you know, it depends on how, how it is, uh, you know, how people word it. I mean, obviously, you know, we have a big winter storm on the way. We're not going to get it right in everyone's backyard. Um, if someone says, you really? know, what happened, yeah, well, most of the time, 99%. Um, if somebody asks me, you know, what happened, that's fine. It's the people who say, oh, you know, I wish I could get paid for being 99% wrong all the time. And, and, um, but I have actually a new New Year's resolution that I don't respond to people who are rude. Uh, I will hide it, I will delete it, or I'll block it, but I will not, I will not reply to it because a lot of times they just you know people just want to rise out of you and i don't want you know with social media i do a lot of social media and i don't want my pages to be a place of negativity i feel like we have so much of that in the world but you know the forecast will go wrong and and typically what i try to do is explain why you know the atmosphere is complicated and we're trying to predict the future and then especially for the philadelphia area we have the ocean on one side, we have the mountains on another side, and it's really complicated. And so, um, I, but again, I like the challenge of it. I love winter storms. The the more difficult to forecast, the better. Um, because it's it Jim Cantore, right? Yeah, yeah, right? If he ends up in your neighborhood, man, you better button down the hatches, right? <laughs> so, There's a great promo like that. <laughs> so what about, um, speaking of like your social media, like, and you're on there quite a bit, obviously, for your job being a very, very big part of it. What is the craziest thing do you feel like you've ever had somebody say to you? <laughs> um, I've actually had this from more, more than one family. Probably about three people have told me that um, their grandfather, their dad was a big fan. And I sent an autographed photo, which, you know, I do all the time. And that when he died they had him buried with my photo in his coffin, 
So, <laughs> which I'm like, I'm very um, honored, I guess, and kind of grossed out a little bit. I guess <laughs> I never really, I mean, I've had people tell me that about the jersey, my jersey, but it's different when it's a picture. I mean, I, my, my husband isn't going to want my picture in his coffin with him, you know, so, but at the same no. point, that's a uh, real honor. I've had a lot of them on the, on the positive side. I've, I've met a lot of young Cecilies in the Philadelphia area. I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, let me introduce you, you know, to my 12 year old daughter that I was pregnant watching you and named her after you, which for me, when growing up, I hated wow. my name. And so, so I think there are a decent amount of Cecilies in the Philadelphia area. And that's like, that's the ultimate honor that you would, you know, give your child by name. So I only get like a dog or a cat named after me. You know, I never get any kids. That's not <laughs> <Acres. good. laughs> Do you? Well, maybe there are a lot of Davids in the Philadelphia area too. So who knows? Maybe, you know. Yeah, but it's not acres, you know. <laughs> so you kind of answered this earlier when you started skiing. Um, but somebody was curious what your thoughts were on collegiate skiing. I, I don't know if you've even paid much attention to that at all uh, so far, but. I don't really pay any attention to it. I, I follow some of them on Instagram and yeah. um, they're, they're amazing. But Brooke, Brooke Burke, isn't that her name? Baldwin. Brooke Ball, Baldwin. Brooke Ball. She's, a, she's mm -hmm. amazing. Jamie Bull I, is another one that's uh, out there. Yeah, Australia. yeah. Allie Garcia. Yeah. There are a bunch of young, right. young, young ones uh, that, see, that whenever, are doing really well. Whenever I see that, I think, oh, I wish I started water skiing you know, when I was younger and, and did that in college. But again, that probably would have changed my whole life, you know, and I wouldn't have ended up here. So I think you pick the right right one there. And then the last one is about your, your industry. And this is, I thought was kind of interesting because of the amount of people that are, are broadcasting from their home, like kind of we, we talked about a little bit earlier. Do you think that there's going to be a shift after the pandemic to, to have some people still broadcasting from home was their question? Yeah. You know, actually I do think so. I, and we have, um, at action news, a lot of, um, our reporters, we basically teamed up the reporters and the photographers where they don't even come into the building. The photographer will go pick up the reporter at, at their house. They will go to the stories. They'll, um, you know, um, log them in the field, send them back remotely. They don't even come into the building. Our salespeople who um, are typically, we're in the news is the first floor, sales is second. Most of them are working from home. And I think plans are most of them will probably stay at home. I think, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of businesses now where you have these big, beautiful buildings and a lot of people are finding out that they can do their job remotely. So yeah. like, what do you even need that big, beautiful building? So I think, yeah. yeah I feel think bad for the owners of those buildings. I know, seriously. As as a guy that has a, some, some rental properties, I'm like, oh, you know, this is kind of crazy. But, well, I say this. I hope for 2021 that your kids kill it on the slopes, not kill themselves. I obviously got to get Emma back back healthy. She'll be but back that, next season, yeah. But that we can get 2021 two line links is what I want us to, to improve on. I know it's a stretch, but let's get two line links. So that's you getting into – 32 off. Oh, wow. I was, right. I was, I'd like to, I, my goal is I'd like to get into 28 off. If I could get into 32 You're, off, man, that would blow so my mind. You were so close to that last year. That's not going to be a problem, especially once you get your, your two, four figured out. And then for me, I want to get at least one at 38. That that's my goal this year. So as we're preparing in our basements, getting all loosed up, um, I know you're you're planning on hopefully making a little trip to to Florida and and knocking off some rust. I'm going to do the same with some of our our, our, our mutual friends. But uh, I just want to say thanks so much for for kicking it with David today. And uh, again, Pete, uh, you know, to have such a professional, such an inspiration to not only the female but but to the men as well. And I, I mean that in a way that's not sexist at all. I'm, it's truly inspirational what you do professionally and athletically um, and, and people follow Cecily, see what she's into. Uh, and I know in Philly, you're beloved. I've had too many messages about it. And, uh, and again, <laughs> well, you to are you, too, you are well, too, you know, <laughs> but this, they don't get this part because so many men were like, Oh, she's so hot. So <laughs> there you it's go. All Greg. The TV makeup, you know, <laughs> the lighting. Yeah, as you see the, the white lighting. beard here, you know, so <laughs> It's good stuff. Thanks so much oh, for, thank for coming on. Thank you so on. much.
Hey, so much fun. Come, come to Philly, visit sometime, okay? We miss you up here. Love to. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.